it's uh, it's a real pleasure to be have the have the opportunity to talk to you. Now, I know I know that what I'm going to talk about here in terms of quantum sensing is probably is is, is really quite different from from uh, your world. So I want to make it both accessible to you and relevant to you, and point out where the kinds of problems that we're interested in addressing. Um, the sensor is just one part of it, and you'll you'll be very familiar with that. Okay, so. Um, before I get into atom interferometry and practical quantum sensing, I want to paint a big picture about the things that interest me, the things that motivate me, what I'm trying to do, what the group's trying to do, and then also narrow down on what part of that puzzle I work on. So the problems that I'm really interested in are, um, they're big, complex problems. And this is where the overlap with DARE is potentially really important. So one of them, for example, um, that I'll talk a little bit about um, today is navigation in GPS contested scenarios. So you, you need to, you, you want to know where you are on the planet and you no longer have, let's say you no longer have uh, the global positioning system or perhaps more, uh, more accurately um, um, a GNSS, so satellite navigation. Um, so you rely on onboard sensors and you rely a, a huge amount on extracting information from a complex environment, a complex world, to work out where you are. Now, this has, this has, um, this has applications uh, both in the civilian space and also in the defence space. Most of the work that I've done has been um, thinking about it uh, for defence, but there's a huge consumer market here. And the consumer market is, is, is going to be driven by um, autonomous vehicles. So um, massive market to, uh, to, um, uh, for applications in this space. When you think about it, it's, it is a problem in sensing and a problem in the rapid analysis of huge amounts of data. All right, so let me, let me put it this way to you. If I were going to navigate, if I were going to build an autonomous vehicle, um, and uh, uh, I was just going to say, all right, well, I'm going to free myself of the limitations of technology. How would I do it? Well, I do it the way we currently do it. We drive down the road and largely what we use is visual recognition. So we look out the window, we see the road, we see a car, we can compute all that information and we can make decisions on the fly. All right, so very complex problem. Humans are really, really good at that problem. Um, the computational requirements to operate, operate purely on visual uh, recognition are beyond us at the moment in terms of what's available in a car. Um, so we have to think of new sensing modalities that give us the critical information only and allow us to compute where that car is and make decisions about what that car is going to do. So it's a, an incredibly complicated problem. Perhaps seemingly a less complicated problem might be the navigation of a single vehicle in a low traffic environment. That's kind of interesting, right? So for me to navigate a vehicle um, through the world where there is no traffic is very different from navigating a vehicle through the world where there is traffic. There are pedestrians and there are other cars. So I separate them and I think, okay, let, let me think about the low traffic problem. Um, the low traffic problem uh, is something that you might have if you were navigating a ship on the high seas, if you were navigating a submarine, if you were navigating an aeroplane. This is, in many circumstances, not all, this is a low traffic problem, but it may be that your requirements on your position are different, more stringent. You may lack a whole lot of signals that are available if you're above the surface compared to if you're below the surface, either below ground or below the water. You may no longer have that visual recognition. What are you going to do? And so there are a bunch of signals of opportunity that you can use in this complex environment, but you have to be able to combine them you have to be able to compute and analyze them. Okay, so these are the kinds of problems that I care about. And there are others that I'll touch on as we go. Now, let's, I'd like to just focus down on my expertise and what I bring, and then broaden out to where people in DARE might be able to, I might be able to work with you. So what we're good at and where I have spent a career is understanding quantum systems. And in the last 15 years, turning those quantum systems on to sensing applications. So extracting information from the world that then can be uh, calculated and crunched and computed to achieve an end goal. 
The particular sensors that I build and the group builds are quantum sensors. And I'm going to describe to you what that means to lift the mystery away from that, from, 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 from uh, the, the idea of a quantum sensor, and also uh, to point out where they're similar and where they're different to a classical sensor. Okay, so um, my interest, complex problems in the real world, my expertise, one piece of it, sensing. And what I need to do is make contact with people in there who are, can compute and analyze data so that we can make decisions based on that. Okay, um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, here we go, whoops, I've gone too far. Okay, so quantum, quantum sensing as um, in terms of what we do, and here I'm going to focus, I'm going to focus largely on inertial sensing, and that is the measurement of accelerations, gravity, gravity gradients, um, uh, and uh, um, ma ma mainly these fields, mainly these fields. I'll, I'll touch a little bit on magnetic fields as well. So for cold atom inertial sensing, what we do is the following. Let's say I want to measure an acceleration. Now, the way you'd measure an acceleration with a classical sensor is you take something like a, um, a spring, and you might put a mass on the spring. So imagine I've got a, let's say we suspend it vertically. So there we go, I've got a little spring there and I've got a mass sitting on that spring. And if gravity were to increase, the, spring, the mass on the spring will, will, will move down a little bit. If gravity were to decrease, the mass on the spring will move up a little bit. By sensing the position of the mass on that spring, I can now measure gravity. And that's the way a classical gravimeter works. It's that simple. They come in different forms. They can be cantilever. They can be micro uh, machine. They can be any number of things, but it's essentially a mass on a spring. It's a classical device. Okay. Um, acceleration and gravity are basically the same thing. We can't separate them. Uh, so when I say gravity, you can think acceleration or vice versa. All right, so what do we do and what's different about our systems? What we do is we take a laser and, sorry, let me back up a little bit. What we do is we measure how far a test mass falls or moves in an accelerating frame in a given time. All right, so we'll stick with gravity. As I said, gravity and acceleration are identical. But imagine I'm sitting in a, in a uh, I, I'm, 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 uh, I'm uh, in a gravitational field and I drop a little test mass and it falls. And I measure the time and the distance it falls. I can connect gravity to the distance and the time through a simple formula. Distance is a half gt squared. Okay? Right, so let's think about that for a second. It's a very, very simple system, number one. Number two, the accuracy of that model has been established to a part in 10 to the 15. Accuracy is an important idea in metrology, very different from precision. If you want to establish accuracy, you have to do multiple experiments based on multiple different, different physical principles and compare all those results. It's an extremely expensive and long-term uh, uh, um, uh, effort to establish accuracy. That formula, x equals a half gt squared, has been established over decades to be, to be accurate to a part in 10 to the 15. And so now we've got, an we've got an absolute connection between the distance something moves in an accelerating field. So the distance it moves and the time that it was moving gives you the acceleration or gravity to establish to a part in 10 to the 15. Okay, great. This is sort of step one. Step two is, well, in a real sensor, we're going to have to measure distance and we're going to have to measure time. All right, so what we do is we set up, a, uh, we set up a, a laser, and in this case, I'm gonna make it a laser pointing vertically down, and I'm going to lock the frequency of that laser, the wavelength of that laser. I'm going to lock that electronically to an atomic transition. And that atomic transition is referenced back to the definition of the meter. That's a, that's a fantastic technological step because what I have now is I have an, a stable, accurate ruler locked to an atomic property reference to the definition of the meter. And so now I'm going to let an atom drop in that laser beam, and I'm going to use that ruler to measure distance. Okay, so great, I've got element two here. Element one is the model, verified to part in 10 to the 15. Element two is distance, is now measured by a ruler locked to the definition of the meter. And now I've got to measure time. So what I do, is I measure the time that it falls using a frequency reference 
which is locked to the definition of the second. Right, that's, that's real. Now, those are the critical elements of an absolute sensor, and in my language, a quantum sensor. It gives you, number one, accuracy. No spring-based device gives you accuracy. There's no accuracy in a spring-based accelerometer. Number two, it gives you stability, the long-term measurements. So this is what we do, and this is where our sensors differ from a classical sensor. So I hope that big picture gives you the idea. Number one, a theory verified to a part in 10 to the 15. Number two, all measurements reference back to the definition of those units. That's an absolute sensor. That's what we built. Okay, so um, let's see, what have I done here? Okay, I'm not going to bother with that view graph. That's a quantum uh, slide that I've essentially said all those things um, in words, and I, I think I'll just uh, I'll just move on from here. Um, and I, I'm having a bit of trouble learning how to drive this. Um, here we go. Let's do that. Um, okay, so the the approach that I just described to you, I, I can give you a I'll give you a, a very uh, a very nice piece of technology that you that you that we use every day. So here is an example of measuring time. So I mentioned in the previous slide that a critical element is the precise measurement of time. And the second critical element is the precise me measure of distance. So let's figure out how we measure time and how we determine location using time. All right, so the way we measure time is we have a, an oscillating, we, we have something that oscillates, oscillates away and we count oscillations. It's that simple. That oscillator could be a mass on a spring. Um, I'm assuming you can see my cursor. Can you see my cursor, Travis? Can you see that cursor? Yes. Yeah, we can see it. Thanks, John. Right. right. So there's a, here's a mass on a spring, and it oscillates upwards and up, up and down. And this thing here um, is uh, effectively a clock. All right. Uh, um, let's imagine that this mass on a spring is, is absolutely stable, and it will be an atomic transition in our model. Now I'm going to have a countable oscillator. oscillator. Here's an electronic oscillator. And I'm going to drive that mass on a spring with that oscillator. So imagine this is an electric field and it oscillates and the mass on the spring oscillates. And now I have one oscillating system here and I have what I call my countable oscillator, my electronic oscillator over here. Right, the way we, practically the way we would run a, uh, a, an atomic clock, not all of them, but certainly microwave clocks that power the, um, uh, that, that's um, uh, quite critical in many applications. What we do is we fire in a pulse of radiation. There's that first pulse, and it starts that mass on a spring oscillating. So there we go. The mass on the spring is oscillating. So I've, I've fired in this radiation, and off it goes. The mass on the spring is oscillating. This will make it perfectly stable. All right. And now I've got this countable oscillator over here, and I'm going to separate them. They're no longer interacting. So my countable oscillator and my atom are oscillating and I'm gonna let them evolve for some time duration tau as seen here. And over time, my countable oscillator may drift slightly out compared to my atomic oscillator. And now I'm gonna recouple them with a second pulse. There they are right there. Now let's just think about this as a mass on a spring. If the two remain completely in phase during that evolution time, when I fire in that second pulse, they're going to, it's going to pump up my mechanical oscillator even more, all right? So I'm gonna get a huge response. But imagine the situation where the mechanic, the, the countable oscillator has drifted slightly and it's, it's precisely pi out of phase. Then when I recouple them, it's gonna kill off the oscillations in the, in the mechanical oscillator. And what I get here, if I were to plot amplitude after the second pulse, versus the difference in frequency between the countable oscillator, pardon me, the, 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 the stable oscillator, this one, and the countable oscillator, I'm going to go through, I'm going to get a, a, something that looks a bit like this. So if they remain perfectly in phase, that is the frequencies are equal, I'm going to get maximum amplitude. If they were pi out of phase, I get minimum amplitude. And along we go. What we can do now is we can lock this oscillator to that stable oscillator, and now we've got a clock. So that's a very concrete example of how a quantum device stabilizes time. We can do the same thing with distance, and I pointed out earlier, we can now connect those to produce an accelerometer. Okay. Um, so enough perhaps about the details of quantum mechanics. Uh, that's about as far as I think I'm going to go with that. Uh, we'll, uh, 
we'll, we'll just step through here and without going into the details of the measurement, perhaps the most important thing that you're going to see on this slide is how well we can measure gravity. So I've got some equations up here that I often talk about with quantum audiences, but here I'll, uh, here I'll go through them fairly quickly. It's, as it turns out, we make a phase measurement. The phase measurement is quantum limited. And if we were to fold in practical numbers for all these, um, for, for the quantities that enter into, in our device, the minimum measurable change in gravity that we could measure in, uh, um, uh, that, that, that we could measure in the lab is on the order of 10 to the minus 10 meters per second squared. All right. So in other words, in other words, the sorts of devices that we develop, at least in theory, would be able to measure gravity out to 10 decimal places. All right. So you can think about that for a second. It's quite an astounding thing, right? So we're going to write down 9.816439. And not only would we be able to say that the error is in that ninth or tenth decimal places place, we can also say that it is accurate to that level. It's not just precise, it's accurate. That is acceleration due to gravity out to nine or 10 decimal places. Now, this number that I've written there is a theoretical number. It's a, it's a, it is somewhat better than the current state of the art, but we will get there. So we're currently at about um, uh, part in 10 to the eight to part in 10 to the nine. And here I'm saying, well, the theoretical that we could get uh, um, with the sorts of parameters that we have as part in 10 to the 10. But these are the sorts of numbers that we deal with. Now let's put that in term, let's put that in a somewhat more concrete terms. Um, there we go. If I have a mass, um, if I have a mass, let's say my, my universe is empty aside from a spherical mass, and I'm going to measure at this point here, a distance and my, my measuring device is distance R away from a mass M. What does that number, 10 to the minus 10 meters per second squared, turn into for a given M and a given R? Well, here we go. Um, I've got this equation right here. M is 10 to the minus 10 on big G, that's the big gravitational constant times R squared. And if we were to put that in terms of, um, uh, if we were to put that in terms of uh, um, what you can in fact measure, we can measure about uh, on the order of uh, 100 kilograms in a one second measurement, a distance one meter away. All right, now you might say, well, that's not very impressive. 100 kilograms is a big person. I can measure a big person in a one second measurement if that person is standing one meter away from me. However, bear in mind that the earth is on the order of 10 to the 24 kilograms and it, and, 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 and it contributes only 9.8 meters per second squared at its surface, whereas right? gravity is weak. It's not a strong effect. So to think that you can measure the gravitational pull of a human being in the lab. So if a person walks past our gravimeter and hangs out there for a second and then walks away, that's, a, that's, that's, that's on, the, on the edge of a measurable effect. And so that's really quite an astounding measurement. All right, what can you learn from this? Well, this is, this is, this is kind of a nice graphic. Um, there's gravity written out to about 10 decimal places. Right now, these decimal places here really don't mean a whole lot. I've just made this up. This should not say altitude. That's a, that was an autocorrect. That should say latitude. Um, I need to change that one. But this is where the different effects enter at different levels in the gravitational field. At that second decimal place, latitude. So if I if you go from the from the pole to the equator, gravity will vary smoothly in that second decimal place. Reason being that the Earth is slightly squished because it rotates, and you have two effects, the centrifugal force in the rotating frame, which is pushing outwards, and also that you're slightly further away from the center of the Earth. Solid density right there in a, the, the fourth decimal place. Who, well, who cares about that number? Mineral exploration, right? You want to find minerals? Measure gravity at about that figure there in an airborne exploration, for example. Um, aquifers, groundwater enters around about in, in these decimal places in here, anywhere in here. So these are all sort of solid density effects. Um, if you want to map and monitor groundwater resources, which is something that we've been working on, working on in collaboration with DARE, you're working at about these figures here. Tidal effects around about here. Now, when we say tidal effects, we don't really mean the response of the oceans. That's sort of a detector that responds to the tides. 
what we mean is the gravitational effect of sun and moon. Um, so even if the Earth were solid, we would have these tidal effects. They enter about here. Glacial rebound. Well, that's kind of interesting. So when glaciers melt, the Earth rebounds a little bit. That effect affects local gravity. We measure it right here. Okay. So all these effects in here are significant in terms of climate change and, cli and, and Earth monitoring. Um, uh, these are signals that can give valuable information to detailed models. Even the air pressure affects local gravity. So if you change the local air pressure, that mass density of air in the vicinity of your sensor enters here. And this is a correction that we apply to our sensors, air pressure effect. Okay, So this gives you a bit of an idea of what you can measure and um, uh, a bit of an idea of uh, um, where that might be useful. OK, let's, um, let's talk a bit about uh, what these sensors bring and what they don't bring. So as opposed to a mechanical sensor, even if it's a micro-engineered sensor, um, what, what these quantum sensors bring is high precision. All right, so in terms of, in terms of metrology, many of you may know this, but uh, I, I, I'll, uh, I'll give the old analogy uh, of target shooting. So if, if, if you shoot bullets at a target and it's a tightly grouped set of bullets on landing on that target, that's high precision. If you shoot a group of, if you shoot bullets at a target and there's the spread of bullets is centered around the bullseye, that's high accuracy. You can have high accuracy and low precision, big spread on the target, but statistically centered around the, around the, the, around the goal, that's high accuracy, but low precision. I can have high precision, tight group, but I missed the bullseye. That's high precision, low accuracy. And what, you, what we want for many applications is high precision, high accuracy. I want to hit that bullseye and I want a really tight spread. So what do the quantum sensors bring? High precision. They bring high accuracy. They have no moving parts, nothing mechanical. Everything's electronic or optical. This one's a key one, I think, particularly in terms of perhaps work uh, that might be interesting uh, in terms of uh, work within DARE. These are highly config configurable sensors. They can measure, so the sensors that we build just through software and electronic changes can measure gravity. They can measure the gravity gradient tensor. So the derivative of that vector field, which has five independent components at any point on in, at, at, at any spatial point. So a lot of information in the gravity gradient tensor. They can measure magnetic field. They can measure the magnetic field gradient tensor. Again, another five independent quantities. They can measure rotation. They can measure acceleration that I haven't put up there because it's basically similar to gravity. But if you're in a satellite, it's, uh, it, we, talk, we think more about acceleration than gravity. And they can measure time. And you do all that just by changing the laser pulse sequence. Now, here's an interesting, here's an interesting uh, sort of an interesting comment, um, I think, which is relevant perhaps to DARE. They're very amenable to machine learning. This is untapped, largely untapped. So let, imagine that you've got a goal that you want to achieve. So you've got, a, you've got some engineering, navigation, uh, exploration goal of some kind in space or on Earth. All right, so, uh, and we could be quite flexible at that, the way we might think about that. So we have some, some goal which is potentially complex in the sense that the set of parameters that we might be wishing to optimize that would define our goal might change. So in one scenario, it might be one set of it's a dial set to some value and on another, um, it might be a, a, a complex goal and it might be a complex goal in a complex environment. And on top of that, something that I haven't even touched on is that the sensor itself has complexity, which so far has not even been accessed by anyone, and I haven't spoken about it, but I'll say a few words about that in a minute. This sounds like a machine learning problem. Right? How do you use all that complexity in the environment to optimally address a complex problem? So the machine learning aspect of this is something that we're thinking about and working on, um, but we need to engage with experts in this. Um, we're not expert. Now, the other side to this, now this is, um, uh, this is metrology talk here, stable scale factor and low baseline drift. Um, um, 
let's translate that into into um, uh, let's get rid of the jargon there. So one of the things that these sensors bring is they they're very very low drift devices, and that's largely tied up with the high with the high accuracy. The high accuracy and low drift are largely linked. Um, there's no guarantee in the kinds of sensors that we build that they will be low drift, but it's a necessary starting point. Building, a, a, building an absolute sensor get, at least gets you in the ballpark of then being able to engineer a very low drift sensor. Now you might ask the question, who cares? Why do we care about low drift? We don't always care about it. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Let me give you an example. Imagine I'm doing a, imagine I'm a mineral exploration person who earns their living from uh, digging up the dirt, uh, finding, finding good stuff under, under the ground and digging it up. And I want to do a, I want to do a gravitational survey, let's say, and I'm going to put a gravimeter in an aeroplane and I'm going to fly across the landscape. Okay, so the typical way this is done at the moment is the gravimeter goes in a Cessna. They need to go in a Cessna. Why? Because the gravimeters are fairly big. Cessna flies at 40 meters per second, roughly. Um, we need to be able to take out the acceleration of the Cessna from the gravitational signal. That's done with GPS and an integration time of about 100 seconds. Okay. What does all that mean? What it means is if you translate that, we have a, um, we have a spatial resolution, 40 meters per second, 100 meter per second, um, 100, 100 second integration time, that's four kilometers is our best spatial resolution. That's not great, but actually what it does tell you is you don't need a particularly low drift sensor. All right, if things were to drift over the scale of hours to days and your signals are coming in a 100 second time scale, I don't care about drift. That drift is going to look like some slow increase on a on, on my signal. And I'll just say, okay, I'm not interested in that slow drift regime. Now let's change that world. Instead of, instead of having a big gravimeter on a Cessna, let's have a little gravimeter, high precision, high accuracy, no moving parts on a drone. All right, why can we do that? Because the atomic devices that we expect to um, be able to produce in the next five years, let's say, will be much smaller. They don't need to go on a Cessna anymore. Okay, so now we've got this drone which is moving along quite slowly. Um, and it can take longer to take the measurements. It gets more accurate measurements. It gets more precise measurements. But if it were a classical device, that drift is now going to kill you. Right? That drift now becomes important because your signal is coming in at much lower frequency. Quantum device. Small, low size, weight, and power, high precision, high accuracy, low drift, and suddenly drift is important. Okay, so these are the sorts of things that we think about, the sorts of things that we work on. Um, now, there are also challenges. So, challenges here are um, gold atom sensors have lower bandwidth than traditional sensors, right? So, if I do have fast signals coming in, um, the quantum sensors are going to have a problem, going to have a problem. What we do is we fuse them with a classical sensor. So we get the both best of both worlds. So basically what we do is we'll take the quantum device, which gives us accuracy, stability, um, uh, and uh, accuracy, accuracy and stability. And we combine that signal with a classical sensor that has no accuracy, but it is high bandwidth um, uh, and large dynamic range. You can see large, large signals and small signals at the same time. All right, so that's the approach that we take for a lot of the work that we do. We have engineering challenges to reduce the size, weight, and power on the laser and electronics, and to and to make it immune to uh, and robust to vehicle motion. These are solvable problems, but they're not they're not um, they're not trivial engineering problems. Uh, whoopsie! Environmental noise. So we have to we have to understand the environmental noise that our systems are working in. These are challenges that we're that we're dealing with at the moment. The sorts of applications that we're working on. Um, inertial navigation, I touched on that earlier um, uh, in, uh, in, on space in, and, and, uh, in space and on Earth. Um, underground and undersea mapping and structure detection, uh, important both for civilian and defense applications. Let me give you a couple of civilian applications that are interesting we can talk about here. Um, as I said, one of the problems we've been working on with, with DARE is that is to ask the question, can we use gravitational, local gravitational measurements to better map and understand Australia's groundwater resources? Okay, so that's a problem I'm going to come back to later. So the idea is uh, if you have water under the ground, 
um, uh, it, it, it will increase local gravity. And if that water were to percolate away or to move away in some underground stream and we would monitor local gravity, that local gravity would decrease as the water moves away. And so we have this probe of what's happening on the ground. I'll come back to that. Um, uh, in, 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 in the UK, interesting, interesting um, application of, uh, uh, of local gravitational measurements is mapping and understanding what the structure underneath the ground is due to, due to mining activities. So as I understand it in the UK, one of the issues they have is that the UK has been mined for hundreds of years. And so now let's say a town is expanding and they're going to build a new suburb. They have to know what, what's underneath it structurally. What is there? Has it been tunneled out? Has it been dug out? What's what's and, and it, it's difficult to get this information. Ground penetrating radar won't get you there. It's too short range. Um, acoustics are difficult because now what are you going to do? Go and blow, go use explosives to drive acoustic waves into the ground. Um, it, it may not have uh, it may not have a strong magnetic signature. Gravity is a tool that's being used increasingly used. Um, uh, aquifer mapping, I've said a little bit about that. Oil well mapping and monitoring, another interesting one. Basic earth science, volcanology. So we're really interested in that one. We think we can map and monitor and look at um, uh, magma as it moves around under volcanoes. What would you learn from basic earth science? What about tectonic plate subduction? Sink a gravimeter onto the surface uh, on, uh, under the ocean and look in the inner subduction zone what's happening. Um, should be able to get hold of the accelerations, should be able to get hold of uh, what happens as those plates move and melt and change. All interesting problems with uh, some significant technology um, overheads to, to solve them. Planetary science. Um, we're interested in uh, we're interested in accelerometers for uh, to better to, to better map and monitor Earth. And I'll say a few words about that later perhaps. We're also interested in um, mapping uh, the, sub, the subsurface lunar and subsurface Mars um, for a variety of applications, for a variety, variety of reasons. And the last one that I'm going to mention here is archaeology, really an interesting one. Um, uh, this tool, the, the gravity is a, is a, is a, it gives you a, 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 a measurable, significant, with good signal to noise um, uh, signal for a bunch of archaeological structures that are potentially interesting. This is something that we've done a few calculations on, not a lot. Is something that we're moving into and considering. So this gives you a bit of an idea about the sorts of problems that we're that we're interested in. Well, let's let's um, oh here's a bit of hardware. Let's, let's let's show you some some pictures of this thing. This is our this is our original accelerometer in the lab. This is uh, about two point three meters from the base up to the top. Uh, it's a device which can measure gravity to about a part in ten to the eight in a one second measurement and can simultaneously measure magnetic field gradients to about pika tesla um, per meter from memory. Um, uh, the details of the device aren't, uh, aren't, uh, aren't um, uh, particularly important here in, in this talk, but one of the key one of the key pieces of technology is actually this thing here. This is a this is a, a mirror which is suspended on a highly engineered spring. Um, and and for, for any of you who are physicists in the room, this spring has a this spring has a has a has a frequency uh, of um, on the order of uh, 100 millihertz, which is is really quite a, a difficult thing to build. It's a very very soft spring, and it means effectively that this mirror is quite well isolated from any um, any uh, building noise uh, or otherwise. And it's it's actually this is a test mass that um, our lasers come down and reflect off this test mass. So rather a nice piece of piece of gear. This device is about 2.3 meters in height. We've done a lot of work to reduce the size of this thing to begin to engineer field deployable devices. And I'll show you a bit about that in a, in, in, um, in a few minutes. Let me just look at the time here. Um, okay, I, I think this slide here is, um, I'm gonna skip over this one. These are the details of quantum mechanics and uh, uh, perhaps not, perhaps not um, uh, so interesting to uh, um, this group. Um, let's take a look at a, let's take a look at a, a few applications here. Um, uh, what have I got here? Um, underground structure. Oh, we've talked a bit about those things. So I think we'll leave those applications. So I've, I've said a few words about those. Um, all right, navigation and GPS denied. Oh, now let's go into this one just a little bit here. So GPS denied navigation is 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 a is a um is is a serious issue. And it's a serious issue both for both in in in, in the defense community, but also in civilian life. 
So when you think about it, we have this amazing tool, GPS navigation, that we have become completely reliant on. Right. So let's just think about it. Um, let's just think about this uh, in terms of our everyday lives. So when we think about GPS, actually the, the major tool that GPS has brought to us is time, time stability, all right? So the way GPS works is you have a bunch of satellites up there in space and they're all sending out a time signal from an atomic clock, which is on board that satellite. And by picking up those timing pulses, you can figure out where you are. And it's really kind of simple um, in, in, in its essence. Um, if I can measure four, the, the, the arrival times of four pulses from four satellites, I can pin down my location on the surface of the Earth. So the first satellite, I know that I'm on a sphere, all right? So if I know how long it took the light cone, the light to get to me, I know I'm on a sphere some distance from that satellite. If I had another satellite in there somewhere else, well, where those two spheres intersect, give me a circle. All right, so now I know where I am on a circle in three-dimensional space. And now I'm going to throw in a third satellite and I've got another sphere that intersects and that circle cuts and gives me two points. And now the four satellite gives me the uniqueness, gives me one point. All right, tremendously useful, tremendously works well. It's, it underpins all secure financial transactions, um, the, the, uh, uh, the timing. So every single secure financial transaction that we do relies on that timing. It underpins our ability to navigate for commercial purposes. We become incredibly reliant on it. If the GPS system goes down, we're in real trouble. And yet we are reliant on it. We have no backup whatsoever. What's it vulnerable to? Well, it's vulnerable to in, 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 um, in times of uh, conflict. It's certainly vulnerable, vulnerable to electronic countermeasures. It's certainly vulnerable to solar weather. Um, uh, it has been, it's, it's often talked about in the media, um, uh, its vulnerability to missile attack, which is by, probably by far the least likely of the scenarios. It's not that the missiles can't be, it's not that the, the, the satellites can't be shot down, they could, and it's been demonstrated. It's that uh, the, the resulting space debris and, and damage to all parties is so high that it's an incredibly unlikely measure that anybody would take. Certainly not out of the question. But the first few, the first, the, the first several are real. So what we need is we need onboard inertial navigation, and in many cases that's the only viable option. So this is the sort of um, this is the sort of application that we've been we've been going after. And as I said, we build gravimeters. We we can measure magnetic field, magnetic field gradients, rotation, time, and all of these can be folded into a calculation which can which can then be used to determine your location on the surface of the Earth. So this is the kind of backup that we're interested in. Okay, um, problem, the problem that we're addressing particularly is that platform acceleration is a serious issue for us. So if this is on a, if this is on a, um, on a ship, a plane, or even on a, on a, on a, or, or on a, a civilian, in a civilian um, scenario, on a um, uh, autonomous vehicle, um, this thing shakes, it wobbles, it moves, it rotates, and none of those motions are useful to us in terms of just determining the location of the center of mass. All those motions fold into the way the quantum sensor responds. So this is a serious issue that we deal with to try and mitigate the effects of that vehicle motion. Just to give you, uh, just to um, just to give you a, a, a bit of an idea as to how these problems are solved, the old way of solving them is to put the sensor on a gimbal. So here you've got this device which has got mechanical bearings in it, and uh, um, uh, let's say it's on a ship, and uh, we've got a sensor right here. And we mount it on this uh, on this red thing here, which has got uh, gimbals on it. Now, if the ship rocks, then the gimbal system stays flat, if you like, in the global frame. What you'd see if you were standing on the ship is you'd see that red bucket moving around as the ship rolls. But actually, it's the red bucket which is staying fixed in the global frame, and the ship is rocking and rolling around it. This is the old way of doing things, a gimbaled system. It works well, and this is being demonstrated with matter wave interferometry on a ship. Um, we have a collaboration with Sydney company Q Control and with um, uh, Air Force Research Labs to do this electronically and computationally by designing specific laser pulses that make us immune to all that vehicle motion. Right, so an again, an interesting 
uh, an interesting uh, collaboration here, much closer to DARE, where we're taking in information from a complex environment and we're designing on the fly for laser pulses, uh, which are tailored to try and give us immunity to um, all those motions that we that that we're that we're um, that, that we're susceptible to, but are uninteresting to us. Um, so there's kind of a nice example of uh, of the way we would access um, complexity in a sensor to try to mitigate vehicle motion. Um, I'm going, that's that's the details of quantum mechanics. I think I'll skip over that. Um, so in addition to the <coughs> pardon me, in addition to the modeling work and the computational work, we implement we implement this on real sensors. Now this is an unusual lab. I hope I can play this. This is our lab. Um, this this is our motion simulator lab. Underneath that pixelated thing, I guarantee there is a real sensor. I'm not trying to uh, I'm not trying to uh, convince you that we have uh, we have something uh, when we don't. Um, but uh, that part has been pixelated out for a whole lot of reasons. Um, let me try. Oops, no, that was the wrong button. Clearly, here we go. Let's play this. This gives you a bit of an idea of what that lab looks like. So we set that sensor up, and then we program that flight simulator with real world data. This is a from a Accelerations from a very turbulent day, plane landing in Canberra. So Canberra can be very turbulent. So we measured that acceleration. We came back, we programmed this flight simulator. We put the sensor, the sensors on board and we can, we can measure all the effects of that motion on the sensor. And then we can try and mitigate those through a variety of, um, uh, a variety of, uh, computational techniques. What you see here in this inset, this is actually, while, while all that was going on, let me just talk to, well, I'll just run it again. While all that was going on, this inset here is a bunch of, these are the actual sensor. This is a bunch of atoms at a temperature, or uh, in this case, of about, um, is about a, a hundred millionths of a degree above absolute zero. All right, so that's the temperature of those atoms. And, um, that it, this is this is what forms our sensing element is that little cloud of cold atoms. Okay, so just to put a few numbers around this, just for fun, um, uh, hundred microkelvin, hundred millionths of a degree above absolute zero, is hot for us. In most cases, too hot. We operate sub sub microkelvin, so maybe um, five hundred nanokelvin or less. Uh, our imaging systems, when we when we uh, that are our basic tool for interrogating this the, the, these systems, um, we can image uh, we can we can see a million atoms easily. Uh, our best our best shot no, our best our best signal to noise at the moment in this system is probably about a thousand atoms, but we can see in other systems a single atom. So these are the limits of sensing that we're dealing with. So it um, gives you a bit of an idea about the, uh, what can be done. Um, da, 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 da. Let's talk about this application for a minute. What have I got? How much, how much longer have I got? I'll stop in just a few minutes. Um, let's talk about our, our, our pipe sensing work. This just gives you a, this is another sort of um, completely different application, but it was a really interesting question that came from Hugh Durant uh, White um, up in Sydney, chief, chief scientist and technologist in New South Wales. Hugh came to us and he asked us the question, um, he asked us the question, would it be possible using measurements of local gravity to detect a leak in an urban pipe before it breaks? All right, so before a major rupture. So you've got this little bit of water leaking out of the pipe and uh, we'd like to be able to find that leak and we'd like to be able to repair it um, at reasonable cost. So I thought this was an interesting question. Um, to put it in perspective, um, uh, as I know now, there are 25,000 kilometres of pipe in Sydney. Roughly 20% um, roughly or so of the water is lost to leaks in pipes from the point of catchment to point of delivery. Just think about that for a second. You know, here we are in a drought, a, 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 a country that suffers severe drought. Water policy is a serious issue. 20% of the water just disappears between the catchment and where you're trying to deliver it through leaks in urban pipes. All right, why? Because it's a surprisingly difficult problem to deal with. Although those pipes are only a meter down in many cases, um, it's hard to locate that leak. There's a variety of techniques. And so Hugh came to us and said, can you, can you measure um, 
Do you think you can get it with local gravity? And we set about doing that. And I'll cut to the chase here just to tell you the, um, let's see, I'll, uh, um, uh, there we go. We went up to Sydney, we cored the ground, we took the cores of those soil samples, we did a CT scan to understand the porosity, storativity, and other soil parameters. We, we ran a, a model where we ran a, a model of a leaking pipe where that water plume would come out and percolate through the soil uh, that we had, um, that, that we'd gone up and measured, and we calculated gravity on the surface. This is after day one, this is day zero, this is after day one, this is after day two, and you can see the water plume developing here and here. We then put noise consistent with what we would measure in the lab onto the gravitational signal, and we could clearly say that you would see that leak. And this was a, a sort of leak that they deal with um, um, in, for leaks in pipes. We then went up to Sydney, and we actually, let's see, what have I got here? There we go. We went up to Sydney and we injected water um, um, or we got a water truck in and they injected water into a into this environment to simulate a leaking pipe and all these little squares that you see here were places where we measured local gravity so we could compare the signals from the measurements to the signals that we had calculated um, this is what we saw at a site called Potts Hill and you can see the uh, you can see the this is the increasing gravity over time um, from day uh, three to this is day, day zero to day four this is measured this isn't um, uh, this this isn't simulation, and the conclusion from uh, we did again at a second site called Strathfield. The conclusion from this was that yes, you can see it. Um, it may be a useful tool if you locate first of all acoustically. So the idea is that acoustically you you measure the sound of a leak on a pipe at one at two points, and you can get a rough idea that there is a leak and where it is. And now if you were to now if you were to try and before you dig holes, pin down the more precise location by making a local gravitational measurement. It may be that in the coming years, this would be a cost-effective uh, way of reducing the uncertainty in where you're going to dig. It's digging that's expensive, right? So that's what you, what you really want to try and pin this down so you dig, you dig in the right place. Um, last example I'm going to give, and then I'm going to quit. Uh, we moved on from Sydney Pipes Project to trying to understand uh, the broader water resource question in New South Wales. So we scaled up from pipes and we went on to water resources. And again, a very, very interesting number. Um, um, it turns out that for the best measured and monitored catchments in, in the world, I think I might've mentioned this earlier, there's about a, there's, there's about a 20 or 30% deficit in where the water is. So forget about the problem of losing water between catchment and Delivery, that's one problem, that's urban pipes. Let's just think about catchment. In the best measured, monitored and understood catchments in the world, if you count all known inflows and all known outflows, there's something like 20% of the water is missing. So where's it going? Surely we need to understand that. It will be groundwater. It'll be recharge of aquifers through groundwater systems, but we need better tools to understand that. So the project that we ran uh, along with DARE was and, and hydrologists at University of New South Wales and Bayesian inversion specialists in Sydney was to, was to ask the question, can we use, for, for our end, can we use local gravitational measurements to be able to get a better understanding of the groundwater systems and where the water is going? We used the Moores Creek catchment in New South Wales as our model. We, 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 we built a, a simple hydrological model of Moores Creek. And these are actually calculated surface gravity maps. That we, that, that, that we calculated for that, for that Moores Creek catchment. Um, the, I'm sorry that the numbers on the right-hand side here will be too small for you to see, my apologies, but blue is areas of high gravity, yellow is areas of lower gravity. You can see dams here um, in the farms. This is recharge from the creek. So this is all due to subsurface effects. This is surface gravity due to subsurface water movement. So um, this was a study that we've just finished. Uh, um, last one I'll mention is imagine that subsurface study we just did for Moores Creek and we're going to do it on the moon. We're not so much interested in water, we're interested in any structures under the moon, but there are predicted to be subsurface structures, um, holes and cavities and caverns that might be useful for human habitation in the future. We'd like to know where they are. We can do the same thing on Mars. So these are the sorts of problems that we, we're interested in. Um, very quickly, these are our collaborations, industrial, defense, and otherwise uh, that, we, that, we, um, uh, that we currently have, and there are more. Um, we get funding from a variety of places, both civilian and defense. 
And I think I will quit there and that hopefully will leave enough time for, um, for some questions.